a lot of the time, when we talk about the English language, there are hard and fast rules that apply in most scenarios, like the fact that the language is written from left to right, for instance. But there are also certain rules, beliefs, and even potentially myths that persist in our collective consciousness. These myths are more flexible, or even completely untrue. This video, and the series that it's a part of, will help educate you on some of the more common falsehoods, or points of confusion, that you'll often hear talked about in your English class. Welcome to our video series titled, Top 5 Myths You Hear in English Classrooms. Number 1. The Myth of a Standard English So, we come to this final discussion after thinking about the way that English is intrinsically intertwined with who we are, and thinking about how the language itself has often been used as a way to separate and distinguish between dominant and oppressed groups. We've seen that the language has changed and continues to change and evolve based on the needs of the moment and of the population that speaks it. Still, a myth pervades in and out of English classrooms that there is one correct or best form of English. Frequently, you might hear this referred to as standard English. Some examples uh, similar to this might be a standard American English, a standard American academic English, or just your straightforward standard English. Regardless, the implication of these ways of speaking about English is that there is a correct, unchanging form of English that you should strive for in order to function in the higher levels of academic or just English-speaking society. This imagined form of English, one that does not contain markers of difference, such as slang, text speech, grammatical errors, even idioms or cliches, is at the root of many forms of linguistic and academic injustice. According to Rosina Lippy Green, in her text English with an Accent, this effort to craft and imagine standard English, or a white mainstream English, as we talked about in our last video, feeds into gender, class, and racial stereotypes whose main goal is to separate out people who don't fit a particular mold. In the case of Standard English, and the academic world, historically speaking, that mold is most traditionally fit for a straight, white, upper-class man. The goal of standardizing the language in this way further capitalizes on the biases that are held in our society against people who may speak or sound or look differently than this one particular demographic. Women, people of color, people from poorer demographic regions are marked as speaking some form of non-standard English that is seen as lesser. At the root of this stereotypical way of framing English, there lies a logical problem. According to Lippy Green, and essentially the entire linguistic community, one cannot standardize a language that is still living. We've established in previous videos that the English language is constantly fluctuating, so the idea that it can be held down and frozen in place is simply, linguistically, impossible. Languages like Latin, ancient Sumerian, or fantasy languages like Elvish or Klingon can be and are standardized because they're not living anymore. No one is actively speaking and modifying these tongues, so we see them in their final state, preserved in amber. It is impossible to standardize the English language until it is dead. The deeper problem, though, is that a lot of your writing experience is going to be framed as if this mythical standardized English is real. You'll be expected to know it, to understand it, without ever being taught it because it does not exist. 
what I hope this video and all of the videos in this series have helped you with is the ability to push back for some change, to consider the rhetorical and linguistic situation each of your classes and even each of your assignments poses to you, and how you can best use the English language that you feel most comfortable with to address the needs of that assignment. Further, I hope it allows you to be able to have conversations with your instructors about the way that English is fluid, moldable, and ever-changing. Finally, I hope it gives you the opportunity to reconsider and rethink the myths that you know surrounding the English language, the cultural power given to those myths, and what it might take to change the power given to those myths, those ideas, and those falsehoods. I hope that in some small way, you've been able to take what this video and the others in this series have been trying to do and to just let it change a little bit about what you know about the language you speak frequently enough to be taking a college class about it. Either way, thank you for listening.